All right. What a blessing it is, huh? Beautiful, beautiful time of year. And you know, we shouldn't just make this once a year that we do stuff, right? Um, we are going to be doing the toy drive for the next week or two because we, believe it or not, we got two more toys, toy runs to go to. We've already been to three. We got one next Saturday that's the with our friends in the Hells and Eagles are doing a toy run. So we go there and we minister to them as well. And then uh, also on Christmas Day, be praying for this one because it's called Christmas, Christmas with Kids. And it happens down in National City. And they have, they're going to be giving away 100 bicycles. And we're part of that too. We buy bicycles to give up to the commute in the community. And we're going to be bringing more toys down there. So as soon as we get rid of these toys, we've also got Angel Tree that we are in touch with from the Salvation Army. We're going to be giving them some toys. And also the Marine Corps Toys for Tots still needs toys. And I'm like, good grief, this is crazy. So we, we started doing this toy drive two weeks ago. Okay, we've already gone through 150 toys. There's another 50 or 60 up here right now. So if you guys want to go get more toys, go get more toys. We're going to get rid of them. So, and uh, also we're, we're collecting money for blankets too. So if you feel inclined, uh, we actually found out we, we can get four space blankets. Those are the thermal tuck things that people wrap up in so they can stay warm when it's like 30 degrees like it was last night. How many realized that it was 30 degrees last night? I had my electric blanket on, I didn't know. I'll bet. <laughs> we didn't turn the heat on until this morning. <laughs> Esther goes, it was 30 degrees last night. I was like, okay, time to turn the heater on. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a blessing to be here today. Uh, again, we went up to Camarillo yesterday, 150 miles one way, and uh, got to hang out with 200 plus little kids and about 100 other bikers, and it was just really exciting. So again, just what a precious time of year to go out and tell people that we love them, but not only tell them that we love them, but show them that we love them. Amen? Amen. So much, so important. Because it's easy to tell people that you love them. Hey, bro, I love you. Uh, okay, are you going to show me that you love me? Okay, and that's what the toys are all about. That's what the blankets are all about. And uh, just, I, I met a guy this morning. It was kind of funny because he, he has a business two doors down from us. And the guy came walking over. He was getting in his car. And I saw him and I go, hey, how you doing? You want to see something cool? So I brought him in here. I showed him all the toys and stuff. And this guy's from Boston. He used to park his car at the party and have it. Yeah, like I used to do. Okay, we, he still got his accent. I don't have my accent anymore. But uh, his name is Sean. Got a chance to minister to him. And uh, pray with him, and what a blessing. You know, God opens so many doors. And the bottom line is we just need to show up, okay? And if I didn't get here early to start doing the stuff that I was doing this morning, I would have never met Sean. And really sweet brother, so we got to keep him in our prayers. But anyway, I want to go to John chapter 14 this morning. We've been continuing our trek through the Gospel of John, and we're going to do that again this morning. And then probably next week we'll start off with the actual Christmas stories and you know all that. How many? How many are excited that it's Christmas? I don't know about you, but I'm excited. Okay, I'm like I'm like a little kid. Okay, I, I see some of these toys and I'm like, dude, I like that. <laughs> I don't want to give that one away. I could be running that up in the parking lot, man. That's a remote control something. <laughs> so anyway, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. All right. Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to have breath, ha allowing us to have life, uh, movement in our limbs, all of the above. And God, just thank you. You have blessed us so incredibly that we can never thank you enough. And so, Father, as we get into your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us in a really personal way and that you would just do a work of your grace in us and through us, Lord, and uh, that your word would come along. Just come alive and just speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. And God, I just ask you to uh, hide me behind the cross this morning, God. That you would be lifted up, you would be glorified, and you would be honored by what happens here today. 
We love you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this morning we are in John chapter 14. And the scene that we're going to be reading about this morning is also taking place at what was known as the Last Supper. This was when Jesus met with his disciples. Okay, and just, just a powerful story. But Jesus is sharing with the disciples what's going to be taking place in the days to come. But he's also trying to give them comfort. Uh, if you were here last Sunday, we talked about how Peter said, you know what? If everybody else leaves you, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. And Peter said that presumptuously. And Jesus said, before the cock, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. And you know, so it was kind of presumptuous of Peter to say, hey, I got your back, okay? But that's exactly what he was trying to imply to Jesus. And you know what? I need Jesus to have my back. How many need Jesus to have your back? And yeah, now, instead of, yeah, Jesus, we got your back, okay? That's a presumptuous thing. But to be a disciple, and I want to talk about that this morning, to, but to be a disciple, you have to show up. You have to be ready to do whatever God's calling you to do, and you got to be available. And there are a lot of people that say, oh yeah, I prayed the prayer, I'm a disciple, but they don't show up. They don't walk with God on a consistent day-to-day -day basis. And that's what we all need, amen? Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but we need to walk with the Lord day by day on a consistent basis. So, and like I said, in the last few verses, Peter said, I will lay down my life for you. Now, what's interesting about that is he said, I will lay down my life for you, but he wasn't living for him 100%, okay? And there's a lot of people that say, oh yeah, I'll lay down my life for you, Lord. And then they don't live it. We gotta live it, hello. Amen. All right, so, we're going to pick it up in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. And this is actually talking about that Jesus is going to prepare a place for us as believers. And you got to you got to understand that. you got to know that. you got to trust in that. Amen? Amen? Because a lot of times we don't, we, I'm going to tell you right now, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Right. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> okay. But anyway, Jesus is speaking in verse 1 of chapter 14, and he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Okay, right now we live in a very troubling world, don't we? We live in a very troubling world. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in our world today. And we got two choices. We can either, either spend all of our time worrying about the trouble, or we can spend our time remembering what Jesus said. Okay? So here he's saying, don't let your heart be troubled. I'm going to yell that. Don't let your heart be troubled. Okay. Why am I doing that? Because there are people in this room right now that are troubled. There are people in this room, all they see is the trouble, okay? You got to get a new mindset, okay? We really do. We need to get a new mindset because if I just worried about everything that's happening politically, I'd rip my hair out. I'd have less than I have right now, okay? And I, I got a couple of patches in the back that I'm working on. But anyway, the bottom line is that we would rip out all of our hair. We would lose our minds if all we did was worry about the trouble, right? Amen. So I am thankful that this is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We all say that we believe in God. How much do we trust him? Mm -hmm. Hello, I am as guilty of that as anybody else in this room. Okay, I tell people, oh yeah, I believe in God. And then when the rubber meets the road, when it is grinding time, and we are going through whatever we're going through, whether it be pain, 
or fear or whatever, we're flipping out. We're freaking out because we don't trust him the way that we say we trust him. Can I get an amen? Anybody in the room in that category? You say that you trust God, but then you don't trust him. Okay, so which is it? Do we trust him or not? Hello? Okay. So as we go on, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now it's going to be talking about heaven in verse 2. It says, in my father's house are many mansions. This word means dwelling places. Okay, we're going to be talking about that more as we go. But before we go any further, I want you to go back to verse 1. I'm going to read it again. Read it with me. Let not your heart be troubled. Hello? You believe in God, believe also in me. So that is the remedy for a troubled heart. Okay? You want a remedy for your troubled heart? There it is. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And I'm going to tell you that a lot of times we don't do that. We don't do that. And yet, Jesus came, died on a cross for your sins and mine, and we don't trust him because we get troubled, we get anxious, we get all that. And the disciples were just getting ready to go into some very troubling time, weren't they? Amen. That's why Jesus told them, let not your heart be troubled. You're going to see me nailed to a cross coming soon to a theater near you hello okay if i was a disciple if i was a disciple and i heard jesus saying stuff like hey you know what you need to believe in me you need to trust in me oh by the way i'm gonna die i'm going to a cross i'm gonna die for the sins of the world and i'm gonna hang between heaven and earth for the sins of the world but don't worry because i'm gonna raise again I might not get the second part of that, <laughs> right? How many, how many are tracking with me here? Right. You yeah. hear, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die. And Peter's like, God, you know. That's what he said. Forbid this. Yeah. You know, I mean, think about it, right? Peter said that. Yeah. God forbid that you should go and do that. And that's exactly the plan that Jesus had. That God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had since the beginning, before the beginning of time. Pretty amazing. So, the remedy for a troubled heart. Let not your heart be troubled. And this remedy is in the same sentence. You believe in God, believe also in me. He was basically saying... If your heart is troubled, just trust me. Right? That's exactly what he was saying. And it's hard to do when things don't seem to make sense to us. But when you go through difficult trials and, and nothing makes sense to us and our hearts are troubled, that is when we need to hear Jesus say, trust in me. And I can't stress that enough, okay? Because too many of us, we get stuck. We get stuck in the trouble. And that's all we think about. And that's all we talk about. And I gotta tell you, there's more to life than being worried about the troubles. Amen. 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 And God forbid that we should fall into that category that we're, we're, we're like Chicken Little. Okay, running around, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Okay. Guess what? The sky's still there. And I, you know, I've been hearing people talking about the end times since I became a Christian. I got saved on May 5th, 1977. And they were talking about the end times back there, back then. And guess what? People are still talking about the end times. And a lot of people just push the fear factor. Guess what? If you are pushing the fear factor, then you don't trust God. Amen. Hope I'm not offending anybody this morning. I'm just letting you know. If you are pushing the fear factor, then you don't trust <clears throat> God. Jesus said, I go 
to prepare a place for you. He said, in my father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. And he told the disciples, don't be troubled. So what do you think he would say to you today? Don't be troubled. This is not rocket science, church. And yet we make it rocket science. And he says, in my father's house, God's house, are many mansions. In the Greek, the Greek word mon, M-O-N dash E-Y, mon, A, and I'm not French, okay? <laughs> and it's not talking about money, okay? It is mon, A, and it means elaborate dwelling places, <laughs> elaborate dwelling places. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. I don't know about you, but I am ready to trade up. Okay, <laughs> elaborate dwelling places. Right now, you are dwelling in this temple, and it's falling apart, right? Well, dwelling in this temple, and it's falling apart. Someday, we're going to be in elaborate dwelling places. I don't know about you, but that ought to excite you to no end, man. Hello? Yes. I go to prepare a place for you. And then he says in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and where I go and the way you know. Before we go any further, where did Jesus go? He went to the cross. Then after that, where did he go? To the right hand of the Father. Right? Let's go to Mark chapter 14. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 16. My eyes are a little bit off this morning. Mark chapter 16, very powerful verse. We're going to look at verse 19. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. It says, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So, what has Jesus been doing for the last 2,000 years? Sitting at the right hand of God, interceding, hello, for you. That means that Jesus is praying for us. How many like that? I don't know about you, man, but I need all the prayer I can get, especially from Jesus. Hello, right? I need you guys to pray for me too, but I need Jesus to be praying for me. Why do I need Jesus to be praying for me? Because I'm a fallible, sinful human being. And so is everybody else in this room. In one category or another, you are sinful. Okay. Uh, and, you know, me and Esther used to tell that to her mom. <laughs> and she goes, I never sin. Because <laughs> kind of humorous, okay? Beautiful little Spanish lady. And, you know, we would try to tell her, you're a sinner. You need forgiveness. You need God to forgive your sins. And it's such a hard concept for some people. For some of us, it's not such a hard concept to get. Because we know we're little sinners. Hello? Just, just checking. Checking the temperature of the room. Okay. In John chapter 1, let's go over there for a minute. Because Jesus came to do what? To show us a life to be the light of the world, to be God in human flesh, to walk with us, to be with not only the disciples, but also now that he lives in us, he wants to hang out with you. Isn't that powerful? Yes. John chapter 1, we're going to look at a few different verses. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. That means that Jesus has always been God. In the beginning was the word. Who's the word? Jesus. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. Meaning the son was with the father. And then it says, and the word was God. So he is part of the triune Godhead, right? Everybody tracking with me this morning? It says, he was in the beginning with God. So Father, Son, 
Holy Spirit in the beginning, working together to create man. How do I know that? Because in Genesis chapter 2, it says, let us make man in our image. It's not God talking about him and the mouse in his pocket. It's not God talking about the space brothers that are going to make men. Okay? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, working together in creation to create everything that you see, everything that you smell, everything that you hear. Right? Okay, so get a handle on that. Jesus is the creator. It says he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Read it with me. He was in the beginning with God. Everything, all things, how many things? All, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made. In him was the life, and the light, the life was the light of men. So powerful. Now I want you to drop down to verse 14. This is how we know that it's Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is amazing. This is the incarnation. Yes. The same God who created the universe took on a body of flesh and he dwelt or tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent with us and made himself at home with us. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus, God in human <coughs> flesh, made his tabernacle with us. Absolutely mind blower. Paul said, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. When was God manifested in the flesh? When Jesus came to the earth yeah. and became a man. And again, if he's God and he says, Trust me, should we trust him? Yes. Okay, again, this isn't rocket science, this is simple Christianity 101. So Jesus left to go to heaven to prepare that dwelling place, our mansions, 2,000 years ago. I look at what happened in seven days, okay? And some people are like, oh, well, you know, one day is 1,000 years. I don't care. I don't care if it's 7,000 years. Look at what God did in seven days or 7,000 years that we, everything that we see, everything that we are able to comprehend with our brains and I'm not talking about anybody else in the room but my brain is kind of small okay so I can't even comprehend all the things that God has done amen can't even comprehend it right. yet he did it for us to dwell with him Hallelujah. on this earth isn't that amazing Again, now I mean, this stuff just blows you away when you see what God has already done right. for you and for me. It's a total mind blower. Next, we get heaven. Now I want to go to Revelation chapter 21. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to look at a few verses here. Revelation chapter 21. And I. Hey, Lauren, can you switch on the light up there? The yeah, light? Yeah, go for it. Okay. I'm getting older. Okay. <laughs> Revelation chapter 21 is a very powerful, powerful verse. Revelation chapter 21 talks about the new Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, but I am excited about the new Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 21 in verse 1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then as you drop down to verse 10, let's do that. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 10. It says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, 
like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. All right, let's drop down to verse 21, same chapter. Verse 21, it says the 12 gates with 12 pearls. Isn't that amazing? The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl, and in the street of the city, the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Then in verse 22, it says, But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun, of the sun, or of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth shall bring glory and honor into it. Now I'd like you to go to Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. Revelation chapter 22, we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and a servant shall serve him. Then it says in verse 4, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent me his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. You know, heaven's going to be an amazing place. Okay? And again... Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So to be translated into the kingdom of light, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then to be translated into heaven, you got to know him. You got to walk with him. You got to experience his love and his joy and his peace in your life. Amen. Amen. So powerful. And one of the things that blew me away as I was, I was preparing this and putting it together, I read a, I read a devotional yesterday, and uh, I'm going to share it with you because it's really powerful. Because a lot of times we wonder, what's heaven going to be like? And there are people that say, oh, I went to heaven, and then I died, and I wrote a book, and all this other stuff. And, you know, they're making, selling books and making movies and everything else. And the bottom line is heaven is going to be so much more incredible than anything that we could possibly imagine. You know that song, I Can Only Imagine? Hmm. Hello? Okay. So beyond comprehension. Amen. Beyond comprehension. That's what heaven is going to be like. Okay. What about people in heaven? Are we going to know one another in heaven? Yeah. I believe that we are. Yes. Why do I believe that? Because there, there's an interesting verse, and this is part of that devotion that I read yesterday. It's in Mark chapter 9. Let's go over there for a minute. This is very powerful. Mark chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 4. Mark chapter 9, verse 4. This is the transfiguration when Jesus glowed and Elijah glowed and Moses glowed yeah. okay this is powerful very powerful in verse 4 
It says, I'm going to actually start off in verse 2. Is that okay, Lauren? Okay. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became stunning, exceedingly white like snow such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. This is pretty intense. Then it says, And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he didn't know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Now, the point of what I just read, I want to bring this home to you, because here's the situation. Moses and Elijah occupy unique positions in the Old Testament. You couldn't find a better representative of the law than Moses the great lawgiver who received the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai, and you couldn't find a better representative of the prophets than Elijah, the miracle-working prophet who called down fire from heaven and stopped it from raining. Okay, so we just read Mark chapter 9, and Mark chapter 9 tells us that Jesus was transfigured on a mountain. Elijah and Moses appeared, and they were talking with him. What an amazing sight that this must have been. I want you to think about this. Considering the fact that by this time, Moses would have been dead for about 1,400 years, and Elijah would have been gone for almost 900 years. So the question is how did Peter, James, and John, who were there with Jesus, know that it was Moses and Elijah. Right? Inquiring minds want to know. How did they know that it was Moses and Elijah? Was Moses standing there holding the Ten Commandments? No. Hi, Moses. Okay? Was Elijah calling down fire from heaven? Were they wearing name tags? No. Okay, this is intense, folks. This is intense. But somehow, Peter, James, and John were able to recognize that it was Moses and Elijah with Jesus. So, here's the zinger, folks. Sometimes people ask whether we will know one another in heaven, and actually, we will know more in heaven, yes. not less. Yes. Right? Exactly. We will know more in heaven, not less less so we will know one another in heaven that's powerful i i don't want to let that go also the bible teaches that there will be a bodily resurrection our body our personality everything that we are will live again this means that one day you will see your loved ones who have died in faith and gone to heaven that's amazing after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, he appeared to the disciples and greeted them with the words, Peace be unto you. Also, as if to say, hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> he seemed to pick up right where he left off. That's how it's going to be when you see your Lord once again in heaven. They're not, our loved ones are not only a part of their past, they're part of our future. Yes. Okay, that should be comforting. To you. That should be very comforting to you. And so I'm excited about it. Totally excited about it. So we got to trust the Lord for that. And this morning when I sent out the email to invite people to our church, I called this answers about heaven because that's what we got. Okay, we have answers about heaven this morning. So you don't have to wonder 
what heaven's going to be like. Jesus told us what it's going to be like mm -hmm. multiple times in the text, multiple times. Yeah. So that's powerful. Okay, so then Thomas chimes in, John chapter 14. Thomas said to him, verse 5, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? We've talked about this many times here at this church, many times, because Jesus responded to that question. And again, this is Thomas speaking, and he says, Lord, we don't know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, what's really powerful about that statement is that he just negated any other prophet that ever came that said, oh, hey, by the way, I'm the way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. That means that you can't get to heaven without Jesus. And you know, there were other people that were on planet Earth. Confucius was one of them. Buddha was one of them. Uh, Mohammed. All these other people that want to point you to somebody else besides Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something right now. That that is a lie from the pit of hell. Hello. Okay. If anybody is pointing you to anybody besides Jesus... That's called universalism. And there are some people that believe that. Okay? There are people that believe that all these different prophets, they're all part of God. They all came from God. That would make Jesus a liar. Just thought I'd let you know. Because I, he said, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's exactly what Jesus said. So if Jesus, you know, there, there's only a couple of possibilities here. In fact, C.S. Lewis talked about it. Okay. C.S. Lewis said that people have come and have claimed to be all these different things. They've claimed to be the Messiah. With the comments that Jesus just made in John chapter 14, you can only put them into one of three categories. And I'm going to tell you what those three categories are. The first one is if he said that he was God, but he was not God, then he was a nut. He was totally crazy. That would be like me going like this. Hey, guys, I'm Napoleon. <laughs> okay, guess what? If I'm not Napoleon, and I think I'm Napoleon, I'm a flippin' nutcase. <laughs> Just thought I'd let you know. You okay. What's that? So you identify. I identify with Napoleon. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I conquer things. <laughs> okay. But anyway, uh, the bottom line is if Jesus said that he was God and he knew that he wasn't God, then he's a liar. Yeah. Right? Yep. If Jesus said that he was God and he knew that he wasn't God, that makes him what? A liar. A liar. So, we already discounted the fact that if Jesus was crazy, we're all in real trouble. <laughs> okay? If Jesus was a liar, we're all in real trouble. Or the only other possibility is that he really was God in the flesh. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Isn't that powerful? That means you can trust him. That means you can believe in him. That means he's going to fulfill his promises. And heaven is part of that package, isn't it? Heaven is part of that package. And you know, I would be totally cool with the fact that when I die, I'm going to a better place. I would be totally okay just with that part of it. But he also said, I came to give life, and I came to give it more abundantly. How many are thankful for the abundant life that you get from Amen. Jesus? Amen. Again, if you are not 
living in that abundant life. And there's a disconnect somewhere. And you need to ask God to help you to get past that disconnect. Because if you are walking around in fear, you are consumed by trouble, Amen. you are consumed by whatever. Amen. I want to be consumed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 I don't want to be consumed by all this other stuff. I want to be consumed by the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. <laughs> Father God, thank you so much that you sent your son to die for our sins, that Jesus left heaven, came to earth to die as a human being, but yet to deliver us, to be our savior, to be our God, to be the one that we can trust. God, you said, let not your heart be troubled. Help us to pour our troubles your, your word says to cast our cares upon you because you care for us help us to not be people that live in anxiety help us not to be people that live in trouble but to trust you that what you said you are going to perform mm -hmm. and so God we love you and God I surrender to you right now and I just ask you to forgive me for my anxieties. Forgive me for my trouble that I allow in my life, God, that I allow the, the, the things of this world to cloud my mind, the troubles of this world to consume me. I ask you to forgive me, God. Thank you. Man. Help me to trust in you more Thank you. every single day. Amen. I love you and I thank you. Uh, we're going to close with a another Christmas, Christmas carol. Yeah. And all these all of these Christmas carols are so beautiful, and the theology that went into them is so profound that we just need to trust them. You know, you know those old carols. Those are that's some great worship right there. Yeah. So let's worship the Lord with Silent Night. Oh, oh. If you know the word sing along. Mm. If you don't, no, oh, come on, that's not that can't even be true. <laughs> At least they're the first stanza. <laughs> yeah. Right? That's that's why we have the words on the screen. So that you'll know all the words to Silent Night. Silent.
God bless you guys and gals. Thanks for coming this morning. We got some refreshments out on the uh, counter out there. Hang out, have some fellowship.